thank you, thank you everyone for your patience. I wanted to welcome you to this afternoon's webinar. Um, I'm Chris Kane, CPWR's Executive Director, and I'd like to welcome you to this webinar entitled Fall, Pre Fall Prevention in Roofing, a discussion with the United Union of Roofers, Waterproofers, and Allied Trades. This webinar is part of an ongoing series of fall related webinars that CPWR has produced as an organizing member of the National Fall Prevention Campaign and Annual Safety Stand Down. The OSHA NIOSH CPWR campaign and stand down aim to eliminate fatal falls by encouraging employers to plan, provide appropriate equipment, and train workers for fall safety. More information can be found on stopconstructionfalls.com. As most of you know, falls continue to be the number one cause of work-related fatalities in construction. With 401 fatal falls from heights in 2019, that's the last year that data is available for, that showed us a 25% increase over 2018. And of those 401 fatal injuries, roofs were the primary source of 146 worker deaths. Those 146 workers who died were from many different trades. They were not all roofers by any means. Um, we've invited the union, the United Union of Roofers and Waterproofers to share their, ex their expertise and lessons learned from the roofing industry to help keep anyone accessing or working on roofs safe. Joining us for today's discussion is Richard Tessier, Director of Safety and Curriculum Development for the roofers, as well as James Curie, master trainer and subject matter expert. Thank you both for being here. Um, participants on today's webinar asked many questions during the registration process, so we're gonna jump right into those in a minute. I also want to invite folks to submit questions um, during the webinar at any time via the chat or the Q&A functions on, on your screen. Um, while we probably won't get to all of those or get to many new questions at all, we'll definitely use them to help inform what we do in future webinars in this series to make sure that our webinars are responsive to the needs that you guys are telling us you have or the issues you guys identify. So with that, Rich and Jim, I'd like to kick off our chat by first asking you to provide some background about yourselves. How did you get started in the roofing industry and how did you become involved with safety and health? Well, I'll start if it seems okay. Um, I started in the roofing industry in 1984. I was actually just looking for a job. I was um, not really excited about finishing my college and I ended up here. So I've been in the industry since 84. I um, kind of fell into some of this training with faulty stuff. Um, I will say that I guess Jim may say the same thing. We're probably kind of a individual group of people that uh, didn't go to school for safety or a safety expert. We learned everything from the ground up. We wore the harnesses. We we use all different types of fall protection, and uh, fortunately, we are still here to talk about it. So hopefully, that will help. Uh, Jim. I got started in, in 1968. Again, I was, uh, it was just my job that was going to get me through college to become a secondary education teacher. So how I got involved in safety was uh, somewhere along the line, I became an instructor for apprenticeship. Safety is a big part of apprenticeship training. So I fell into safety that way, but uh, well, no pun intended. But, uh, Again, I was I started roofing before OSHA the OSHA Act was even passed. So I've seen it from the, as Richard said from the ground up. The evolution, the equipment changes, the safety culture development, seen it all. So here, so, so you people to pick my brain and see what you can find in there because I'm not in trouble with it. Ask, ask away. All right. Well, thanks. I'll get started with some of the questions that were sent in. Um, the first one is equipment related. So the question is, why do some self-retracting lifelines have shock packs and some don't? Well, before, I think Jim's going to be better at answering that question, but before we get into too much of that, I want to just remind everybody that 
this was titled as fall prevention, which uh, we'll probably get into in a little bit. Prevention would be that we weren't going to fall in the first place because we prevented it. Not to be confused with fall arrest, which I'm sure we're going to talk about. Fall arrest is we allowed some in the fall and then we have to catch them. Um, so the reason I'm bringing that up now is because Jim's going to explain the difference between the two and, and what they're used for and, and uh, go with that. Okay. So again, the self retracting lifeline, uh, there are two types. One is to be used <clears throat> for the leading edge. Leaning edge work means you have the potential to fall over the edge. And that lifeline, that cable is going to be put under pressure on the leading edge, possibly cutting it or grading it. So the shock pack on the SRL is only on the leading edge. And so that shock pack is to take some of the pressure off of the cable so it doesn't snap. Because if you're using an SRL that does not have a shock bag and you go over the edge, there's a good potential for that cable to either snap or be cut. And that's not exactly what you're looking for. So again, the SRL without the shock bag, it's probably not set up for a leading edge work. A leading edge shock bag is set up for working near the edge and falling over the edge. Right. The, the original SRLs were designed to fall straight down, which uh, doesn't happen a whole lot in construction. They usually fall over an edge or into a bowl. Um, and then the other the other thing that they're, the one without the sack I could be used for would be restraint, which is um, actually difficult to actually set up properly. But that would allow you to never get to the over the edge, to, to not ever allow you to fall. Which is fall prevention. Which is fall prevention, correct. The other thing about the SRL without the shock pack is do not add a shock pack to it. It's not designed for that. So you adding a shock pack to that SRL is not going to help. Yeah. I'm just going to move on, but I just want to throw this in real quick because I'm hoping that there's a lot of working contractors and workers here. This is my personal belief. I, whoever purchases these products, I think in the roofing industry, there's, we should never even have man leading edge retractables. We're, we're not set up. We're always working near a leading edge where we would need the leading edge retractables. That makes sense. All right, thanks. Um, the question, this question goes in the category of best practices and requirements is why can't we, why can't we get rid of the warning line and monitor system? Most, most contractors don't use it or use it because it's cheap and they don't necessarily use it correctly. Well, I'm glad you brought up best practices because if your safety program that you've set up is just to avoid OSHA citations or just to meet the minimum requirements of OSHA, which OSHA is just a minimum, you're set up to do that. You're not you're doing your members at the service. You're doing your employees at the service. Best practices is what we teach and what we train because it goes above and beyond OSHA regulations and it incorporates some ANSI uh, standards. And it's what we've seen out on job that works. So best practices is the way to go for fall protection. Right, and, and I think, um, I don't know who asked the question, but, but maybe you can get rid of it because a lot of general contractors are, are not allowing it and a lot of roofing contractors themselves are deciding to not use the, that system. It, um, it, it relies a lot on um, individual perception of what would be safe work and what wouldn't be uh, outside those warning lines. And it relies on the safety monitor, which is a part of the warning line system. And that's, again, that's just a human. And not to mention there's probably a little bit of abuse when it comes to that system, which yeah. is typical. So getting rid of it, I mean, how do you get rid of it? Uh, that's up to OSHA. To try to get rid of it as far as a regulation, but. Uh, if it were something that would help eliminate the falls, I would have no problem with it. We, we, we in my opinion, it's, it's it, it started in the days of the built up roofing where, where retractables or different different fall protection equipment would get gummed up in the asphalt. 
that's not it's 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 not as common anymore so yeah i think that's enough on that subject okay um you know one of the comments that came in is that it's osha's got some requests for information out on walking working surfaces but those standards apply to general industry, not necessarily construction. I mean, they may use the information to inform what OSHA does in construction in the future. So I guess we'll just have to wait and see on that one. Um, one of the questions that came in is about, say, other trades assess, assess accessing the roof. So when accessing roofs for routine facility maintenance work by portable ladder or fixed, what are some ways used to get materials to the roof, albeit a sloped roof or a flat roof? I'll start and then I'll let Jim finish that one. Um, if you're accessing a roof for routine type things, it probably does not fall under the construction standards. It would be general industry. Um, and our roof repair would fall under construction. So we generally wouldn't get into that a whole lot, but, but Jim would have some good ideas of how to get things up on your roof? Well, it's, I was a repairman uh, for a big portion of my career. And one of the things, you know, if you got to get some materials up there, maintenance item or repair to the roof, uh, one of the best ways to do that, I would suggest, is you create your own little backpack that you can wear while you climb the ladder. And you carry the materials up in that backpack while you're still climbing the ladder and maintaining your three points of contact. If it's more than that, once you get up there, set up an anchor point and use a uh, use a hand line to pull up the materials that way. So you're protected from falling with the records in your ball protection harness and pull it up by hand. Don't carry anything up a ladder that's going to cause you to lose your balance and, and fall. A lot of people say, you know, according to OSHA, you can't carry anything up a ladder. Well, according to OSHA, you can. And to me, the best way to do it is with a backpack so that you can keep your hands on the ladder and climb and run with it. All right, thanks. Um, this is about, well, it's under the best kind of requirements. So, can you explain the difference between the fall restraint and arrest requirements in the roofing industry versus constructions and general industry? And is roofing considered construction is the question. Sounds like more than one question. There's about four in there. <laughs> um, first of all, roofing is construction. Um, as far as restraints, Basically, the equipment is going to be the same restraint. We don't like to get into it a whole lot. The anchor point may not re may not need a 5,000 pound requirement because you're not going to fall. The downside to that in roofing is, when you think about it, it's very difficult to set up restraints in what we do because we still need to reach the corner of a building where if we moved a little bit to the left or to the right, we could fall. So restraint is difficult and if we were to fall, under a restraint system, which you should never be able to, uh, the anchor point may not be sufficient. Jim, you got anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, as far as general industry and uh, construction industry, yeah, general industry rules are different. And if and if you're going to go looking in in your code of federal regulations, 1926 looking for fall restraint under subpart M, which is fall protection, you're not gonna find restraint in there. So, but once again, restraint is fall prevention. And if you can set it up, please do, but it's not as easy to do as fall rest, which most people are gonna use anyway. All right. Um... Is controlled access with a person monitoring workers so they don't get too close to the edge still used in the industry? Well, in the roofing industry, uh, we don't call it controlled access. Controlled access zone is a little different, but very similar to what we use. We use a warning line system 
in conjunction with a safety monitor. They have to be used together. You can't just set up a warning line system, which, you, which is what you can do if you're setting up a controlled access zone for other trades. Roofing, warning line system, and safety monitoring system. And yes, it is still being used uh, quite frequently. And maybe unfortunately, because it's not the best system out there. It's the easiest and cheapest way, which is what we saw in one of the other questions. But yes, you can use it. All right. Um, are there different rules for residential roofers versus commercial roofers um, as it relates to harness and tie-offs and that type of thing? No. That's easy. First, first, answer, first of all, when uh, when when people differentiate between commercial roofing and residential roofing, I think they're probably talking about steep slope roofing versus flat roofing. The only real difference is in a flat roof scenario, which would be 412 or less, you can use the warning line system. In a steep slope system, you cannot. Um, some of the guardrail rules would change a little bit depending on the slope of a roof. And since I think it was back in uh, before 2010, no, the six foot rule of fall protection applies to everyone regardless. So there is no there is no opt out of fall protection when you're doing any kind of roofing. Well, this kind of leads into another question that that someone asked, and they say, why do residential re-roofers consistently represent the highest allowed fall claims? I'm not exactly sure what they mean by that, but I don't know if you would. I think that relates back to. Uh, Previous years, the residential people could use slide guards as their fall prevention and fall protection. Uh, that has been eliminated. They have to follow everything that's under subpart M. So that changeover may have taken a lot of time to, uh, to become an, into effect. That the rules had changed, the regulations had changed. So a lot of people were just going with what they knew previously. It's not easy to change people's habits. So. They probably got stuck in that mode of we did it this way for so long, we're going to just keep on doing. It. Right. Um, some could call it lack of training or, but you know, they they should be using the same systems. Right. Um, and this also is kind of like related to the big change we had in the numbers from 2018 to 2019 and the fatality numbers. So what would you would attribute some of that? increase too, that alarming increase, um, in particular the falls from roofs. Go ahead, you start that one. Yeah, we, we've tracked it over the years, and, and if, if you look back in the last maybe 30 years or so, uh, the number of falls really depends on how much work is being done. In times when the economy is slow, like in, for instance, uh, 2007, 2008, the numbers went down for fatalities. But that was basically due to the number of hours worked. We've pretty much flatlined as far as that goes. Uh, there's more work, there's more people getting hurt. And there's less work, there's less people getting hurt. And unfortunately, that's the only way things have been changing. And that's the problem. To me, that's the problem. Those numbers aren't changing. We're doing something wrong and we're not fixing it. We've, we've run this plateau. We got to break through that to the point where people can understand. We have to change the safety culture, the way people think, the way roofers think when they're out there. To change those numbers and lower them and keep them going down permanently, not because of the economy. It's because we care. Yeah, and I, and I think sometimes those. We're not real big on statistics. We know we have a problem. We know we have to fix it. The question we have is, is, where is the problem and what is it? Because whatever we're doing now is not working. I will say the reporting, um, there, there is a difference between falls from roofs and roofers falling. Anybody can be working on the roof, a carpenter, electrician, a plumber, who knows? So we, we depending on how it's reported, doesn't necessarily mean it was a roofer that, that fell. 
Um, so that can skew it a little bit too. And along those lines, while we're on that uh, on that subject, a lot of people, different trades come up on a roof, and the roofer may be using a warning line, safety monitoring system as a form of fall protection. So now a carpenter or a plumber, or another trade comes up on the roof, and he assumes that he can use that as his fall protection, and he can't. That's only for roofing work on low sloped roofs. It's not for everyone up there. So if you're a roofing contractor or a foreman and you see another trade come up on your roof, they have to supply their own fall protection. They can't go under ours. And I think some of that may be attributed to that fact. Some of those fatalities. All right. Um, one of the questions that came in was about rescue. So what can you say to address rescue plans? And if you have any experience with self-rescue devices? Um, I'll, I'll start because I know Jim's got a lot to say. I'm just going to say, um, in most cases, we're not ready to discuss rescue plan because we're not wearing the stuff that we're going to be rescued at anyway. So I'll start with that. We, we, we definitely need a rescue plan. I'll let Jim talk about that, but I'm going to say the majority of contractors out there maybe start maybe should start thinking about what our fall protection plan is first before we talk about a rescue plan. I'll give that to Jim. Well, anytime you're going to put someone into a fall arrest system, you should, not should, you shall, which means must have a rescue plan. I, uh, when I'm teaching uh, fall protection, especially in personal fall arrest, I tell people, the moment someone tells you to put on a harness, Ask them, how are you going to rescue me if I fall? I guarantee nine times out of 10, that's the first time they thought about rescue. It's when you ask them. Uh, people just tend to think that no one's going to fall. Everything's going to be fine. And if they do, we'll just pull them up by the lanyard, by, the, by his lifeline. Well, that's not a rescue plan. A rescue plan has to be a written plan. And, and you need to have a plan A and a plan B. And it has to be site specific, as Richard just said. Because the site changes from day to day, the plan has to change from day to day. It could be a simple plan of, okay, we have a ladder, we know we can reach that person. That's a plan. But what if you're on a high rise and the ladder's not going to work? And 911 is not a rescue plan. You have to have a rescue plan in place that is site specific. And everyone has to know that's in the crew knows the plan and how it works. And if it's going to be any kind of a rescue that the crew is going to attempt, they need to be trained in that rescue. There's a lot of rescue equipment out there. There's even self rescue equipment. Some of it's very easy to use, still needs to be practiced. And every crew member needs to know his role. Orthostatic shock or suspension trauma is real. People can be injured or even die from suspension trauma. So the rescue plan has to be able to rescue someone at a maximum of 15 minutes. It needs to take effect immediately after yeah. the fall. It's a very important part of anybody's uh, personal fall arrest system but it's the least thought about. All right, thanks. Um, shifting gears a little bit, and this is kind of an interesting question. How should homeowners participate in safety practices for contractors? Well, it's nice to know that homeowners are actually thinking about safety. Yes, that's the start. The homeowner is the owner of that building and the owner would have a say. Um, and they also have, they also have a choice of who to hire. Um, I I sometimes tell people that um, you know if you're if you're going to buy tools, you don't go buy the cheapest tool. You buy tools that are going to work and that are going to going to help you. Um, but it, sometimes when it comes to roofing a residential home, people think the cheapest is the best. Or it's their their only option. Oh, it's their only option exactly. It, it's, it wouldn't be a bad idea for that homeowner to, to verify with that roofing contractor that they are going to, let's, let's put it this way, um, they'll at least 
adhere to the OSHA standards. Uh, I would prefer over and above any day, but at least adhere to that. And they have the right to do that. It's their home. Yeah, and it's <clears throat> like any homeowner. Ask a lot of questions. Just the questions and, and while they're working, see what they're doing. If you're home, if you're there, see what's going on. You don't want someone falling off your roof and dying in your yard. So, yeah, I'm glad the homeowners are interested. Yep. I just wanted to kind of have a commentary. We developed many years ago now a pamphlet for homeowners who were considering hiring someone to re-roof their home. Um, I'm not sure if Jessica can find it. I think it's somewhere in the Stop Construction Falls website. Um, folks may, we may be able to post a link to that and share it with someone who's planning to hire someone to re-roof their house. Um, I'm going to kind of go back to the equipment related questions. Do you have any good fall protection solutions for roof work on sloped one story roofs? Most personal fall arrest system options require a greater fall clearance to be effective. Uh, yeah, um, retractables are a great system as long as the anchor point is above. Because uh, in a fall, the retractable should stop the worker in as little as two feet. But that two feet really wouldn't start from when they fall over the, the bottom edge of the roof. So if they're sliding, that would take up slack from between them and their anchor point. So that would eliminate some of that free fall, which probably would be the best system, in my, my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, because most conventional uh, lifeline in the lanyard with the shock absorber you may need as much as 17 and a half feet clearance if you know if you fell off a one-story building 17 and a half 17 and a half feet you're going to hit the ground so the system has to work that you're not going to hit the ground and on uh, a one-story building you're either going to be looking for restraint if possible and then definitely the srl would help because it would lock up and create a less of a free fall right and i and i know um a friend of mine by the name of Tom Bobek has been working on um, guardrail type things for residential, which is, which is another option. Um, but the most important thing about when you're, wearing, when you're using anything with an anchor point in roofing, we don't really have much above us so that it's important to keep that anchor point as high above us as possible, um, at least from the shoulders up if you can. The downside is if we anchor below us, because that's all we have, we are going to have a free fall that's possibly going to be greater than six feet depending on the situation so yeah most importantly keep the anchor point up high the best two options would be guardrails or retractables so i'm just trying to watch some of the chat that comes in and and folks are you know following what you just said rich you know somebody said please discuss swing hazards and if you have a situation where you have a fall and then a swing you have to make sure that wherever the fall might be would be free of hazards if that worker fell. So you're really talking about a really limited distance if there's a, a slip that, that has to be yeah. addressed. Um, and, and, and swing falls should be addressed in a fall plan. I'll let, I'll let Jim cover that a little bit. The, the swing fall is gonna occur when you, your anchor point, when you're anchored and you go out on angles away from your center line, that's going to add to a swing fall, especially with a retractable. As you play out more line to go out on a 20 or 30 degree angle away from your anchor point, which we'll say is zero, you're out at 30 degrees and you fall, you're going to, you're going to swing back past zero, out beyond, and then have a pendulum effect, possibly swinging back and forth, which would operator cut your lifeline or it's force you to hit an object that you weren't planning on hitting down below. And also, it's going to bring you closer to the ground. If your SRL locks up when you fall at 30 degrees, you may swing down and hit the ground anyway. It adds to your fall distance. And, and most of that stuff, most of that equipment has angles that you need to stay within to, to decrease that. But, but still, the rule is when you fall, 
not only can you not hit the ground, you can't hit anything else either. Which means if you know if you're setting yourself up for a swing fall, you have to know where that could take you, and you can't hit anything on the other side of that swing. Not that you would want to set up for a swing fall, but it, it's the way it is. And, and most people think that a swing fall just goes like this. Normally, when you fall, you fall forward, and that swing fall could go this way. And now you're hitting the building or whatever. So you do not want to have a swing fall of any kind. So once again. Refer back to the manufacturer specifications for setup on all equipment. That's part of the problem with equipment is when people get it, they go in and this is great. They open up the package if they have the opportunity to open the package. Sometimes it's opened up at the roofing contract or shop and just sent to the job. No instructions. Here you go, guys. This is great stuff. Figure it out. Yeah, that he makes a good Wait, point. I'm not sure if there was a question asked about that or not, but um the, the instructions have to be there with when you're installing that anchor point. And and when you think about an anchor point on a say a residential roof, it's gonna tell you exactly how many holes you need to fill in that anchor point and what exactly what fasteners to use. So just sending out a bag of nails isn't the right way to do it. It, it may say screws, it may say nails. The manufacturer doesn't know what you're putting it into. Are you putting it in the concrete? Are you putting it in the metal? Are you putting it in the wood? And it'll have specific instructions for each of those. So just because we got an anchor point doesn't mean it's correct. Um, it would be the duty of a competent person to, to verify that, that that's installed the correct way. Right. Um, I just wanted to mention there's been some questions in the chat about the homeowner's brochure, which Jessica did locate. and posted a link to, but she's also been posting as you've been talking. Um, we have infographics on choosing the right length of lanyard on suspension trauma and anchorage and with a with a link that's posted in the chat. And also, gosh, there's more. Um, <laughs> she's posted the link to a sample written fall protection and rescue plan template that we developed for the false campaign. And we have that um, up there for free for the taking in both English and Spanish. Um, the, she keeps going. <laughs> oh, she There's posted some more on your code of federal regulations. Yeah. So Just remember uh -huh. those are templates and you still need to kind of have an idea of the situation and what's going on. So, so just, uh, there is no rescue plan that you can just download and it's going to be work for everything. Or, or even a fall protection plan. Everyone is different. Absolutely, but I think particularly for the most unsophisticated, unsophisticated contractors or new contractors, um, without defining them further, you know, it's it, the resources to start. To start, Absolutely. and we do have yes. a, a series of resources for small contractors that Jess has also posted. Um, so I'm going to shift gears to a different question. Um, can you define what is required for fall protection on skylights and what types of skylights are acceptable or not acceptable in roofs? I'll start and I'll let <laughs> you finish. Um, a skylight, according to OSHA, and once again, we prefer to go a little above that, but I'll start with that. Um, working around skylights, you need protection by either fall arrest, fall restraint, guardrails, or a cover. Um, Skylight is considered an open hole. Correct. For the Correct. So, is there a manufacturer? Well, I'll, I'll let Jim talk about that one. But we're, the definition of a cover and the strengths are are difficult to find, but um, they are defined. And it needs to a cover on a hole needs to withstand twice any load that may be imposed on it to kind of shorten it up, which means imposed on it anything that could get on that cover will get on that cover on the roof um, you have to look at it that way and then it doesn't really address when they talk about that falls into that cover and most people don't just go sit down on a cover of a skylight or a skylight itself they fall into it which is adding to that force which could create more load but um there is a letter of interpretation about skylight lenses now let jim just cover that real quickly so even if a skylight supposedly by the manufacturer is rated to support, say, 500 pounds, you would think that would be a, a, 
a good cover. But we also got to figure out the impact forces too, because when, as Richard said, a lot of people, when they fall on a skylight, they're backing up and their butt lands on top of the skylight and impact forces from 17 inches is over a thousand pounds of impact force. So if you think that lens looks like it's pretty strong and it's going to hold me, if you fall onto it, it's not going to hold me. I, I know personally of many people that have fallen through skylights. I've seen it happen on jobs that I was on. I'm talking about the plastic lens covers. And anything that's out in the sun, for as long as the skylight's going to be the life of a skylight on a roof, the weather and the sunlight is going to degrade that cover, that lens. So it may start out looking like something good, but in the long run, it could be very fragile by the time you get to it. So once again, a, a skylight is considered an open hole. And I've been on jobs where there's nothing but skylights. There could be a hundred on a job. Every one is a hole and needs to be covered. They do make up, they do make covers now that are portable and you can just place it over the skylight. They also make safety netting that you can put over a skylight curb. So there are many ways to protect skylights now than they were in the past. Yeah, I don't. But they all need to be protected. Right, and I don't think we're against skylight manufacturers for making better skylights. I, we would love to see that. I, the, the part that scares us is, and there are some out there that claim that that they meet the OSHA specifications. And the problem is, after they're out there for 10 years or 20 years before the re-roofing takes place, is the label still there? And do our members or our, our workers know that? And and so to throw a couple in that are safe with hundreds that are not, is kind of a scary situation. So as far as we're concerned, until it's all the same, we're gonna teach that they're holes and we're gonna protect our workers from those holes. Yeah, the worker is gonna work on a, on, a, on a job and he's gonna say, hey, guess what? I worked on this job and the, and the skylights were safe. We didn't have to cover them. So then that word gets out and the next guy goes on to a job and he assumes the same thing. And every job is different. And because I worked on one job with a safe skylight, I'm thinking, oh, they're all safe. So that mistake has cost lives. Right. right. Um, one more thing, kind of a technical thing. The ball protection anchor is supposed to be 500 pounds Per worker. So, but what do worker, what do roofers use as an anchor point, and what are the best options? Well, there's two types of anchors. There are certified anchorages, and there are what we call anchorages of opportunity. A certified anchor only needs to support twice the load that will be imposed upon it. It's a, a safety factor of two. An anchor of opportunity that's not certified, not engineered and designed to be used that way. Yes, that has to su support 5,000 pounds per worker. per worker. So what would be a good anchor of opportunity? Well, something like a steel I-beam, that would work. Uh, would a conduit work? No. That would be a bad anchor of opportunity. You would have to, you would have to in your mind think, is this anchor going to hold my pickup truck. That's the way to go and rule of thumb. But once again, yeah, two types of anchorages, certified and non-certified. You need to know the difference between the two. And, and the anchor point is only one part of that system. Also, people seem to focus on one part. The anchor point is only one part. Every system, every part of that system needs to be done properly for it to work. Anchor point can be great if I, but if I have a 15 foot free fall, I'm gonna have problems. And I should I should mention there's a difference between total fall distance and free fall. It's difficult to explain to people, but the free fall would be where nothing kicks in. Um, OSHA limits that to six feet, and then once that stuff kicks in, everything else is designed to stretch and slow you down before you come to a fast stop. It's difficult to teach. It's difficult to explain, but there, that once again, that's why we need more training. Speaking of training, would you say that tra the, your training is considered unique to the roofing and waterproofing industry? And would you be able to modify the training for other trades? Well, I'm gonna let Jim answer that because he just got done with a full week's worth of 
of fall protection training. Okay, so is our is, is our training unique to the roofing and waterproofing industry? Yes, it is. Uh, for a couple of different reasons. One, we have in subpart M the ability as roofing workers to use some fall protection means that other trades cannot, such as the warning line and the safety monitoring system and the combination of the two. So our training is unique to roofing and waterproofing industry. And we'd like to keep it that way because, as you said, falls from roofs are very high in the statistics, and we know that. So can we modify it to other trades? No, that's up to the other trades yeah. to do their own training and, and make modifications to their systems. Uh, what they can use is different than what we can use. Some of the equipment is similar. But the thing is, as Richard said, we just started a national instructor training program. And I taught a, a class called competent person and fault protection training training. To me, the most important part of any safety program and making it effective and making it work is the competent person and that competent person performing their duties. It's not mentioned a whole lot in subpart N as far as a competent person. To me, that is the key to saving lives and, and lowering the injury rate in, in fall prevention and fall protection. Having a good understanding of what a competent person is supposed to do. And this goes from the top down, from the, from the contractor down to the first guy, his first day on the job. They all need to know who the competent person is and what their duties are and are they doing it. To me, that's the game changer here. All right, great, thank you. Um, one question that came in is what is being done by the union to create a better safety culture regarding fall protection uses, usage, regardless of, of working height? Well, the culture is a word that we've been talking about a lot lately. We actually have um, in our fall protection program, which is currently the competent person one is currently 16 hours, soon to be a 24 hour program. Uh, safety culture has its own module within that program. Um, what are we doing? Well, we're, we're, we're building the program into all of our apprenticeship training. So they're getting it from day one. Uh, hopefully, we'll get to that point where it's across the country. Um, when you talk about a safety culture, it's, it's you need to start somewhere. Uh, Jim would say start at the bottom. Really, it needs to start everywhere at the same time. A culture is difficult. I, I look at it as it's going to take time. Um, when I was a kid, there was no such thing as a bike helmet. Uh, my kids had helmets, but they didn't wear them. And now my kids' kids wear their helmets. There's three generations that change a culture. And this is going to be the same way. We're still fighting. We're still fighting some of the older guys in the industry. We're still fighting with some of the non-believers. The non-believers, exactly. So right. So so we're trying to get it in the heads of the younger people that it's here to stay and let's start accepting it. It's a difficult question to answer, actually. If anybody could figure out how to change the culture in a quick way, that I would love to hear it. <laughs> we spent a lot of years creating the, the culture that we have now, and it yes. was not it was never related to safety. Like I said. I started roofing before OSHA. It was a wild, wild west. It was whatever you thought you could do with your athleticism and and generally what you thought you could get away with and still survive. Right. That was the culture. We expected people to get hurt. In fact, it was like, uh, hey, look at this scar I got. Look at the, you know, I fell off of this. I fell off of that. That was totally the wrong culture. And it's been there for years and years and years. And turning that around is, is part of our job. It's, it's what we're working at. But we need everybody on board. Yeah, including from the top down and from the bottom up. Well, you know, I was I was hoping Jessica would do this. She just posted um, resources from our website on safety, culture, and climate. 
Um, and some of the comments have been uh, flowing as you've been talking about management and management leadership and that type of thing. And I think it's consistent with the consistent with the research. Um, but then there's also, you know, what can happen at the worker level and she's just posted the foundations for safety leadership training, which I think just about every construction worker should go through. Um, so, well, OK, so we, we have our private conversations and I'll pull this one out a little bit. Um, you know, we, we need our contractors for sure, and our contractors need the workers. Somewhere we said we have a problem with falls and it's not getting better. And, and sometimes I personally believe that it maybe takes place between the contractor and the worker. I don't know if it's a communication or if it's a supervisor or so-called company person. But if that myth person is there to protect the contractor from or just to help him make money and doesn't care about the worker, then maybe that's the wrong middle management person. Because truthfully, I believe the best way to protect the contractors, and when I say protect, if we want to protect them from citations and accidents, the best way to protect the contractor is to protect your workers. Um, if our workers are doing the right thing and not getting hurt, we're protecting the contractor at the same time. So there's a perfect example of why we need everybody all on the same page. And I, it takes courage. It takes courage to say we're doing something wrong and we need to fix it. It also right. takes courage to say, listen, we have a problem on this job site and we have to stop the work right now and get it fixed before someone gets hurt. We need everybody to be on board. If everybody sees a problem, see something, get it corrected. Accountability is part of it. If I stand up and, and say we have to stop the work, then everyone everyone knows it was me that stopped the work. And if we can all get on that same page, there, there goes our culture. We started developing the safety culture. Well, I think I think that, you know, that's a really great note to end on. Um, we are up at the three o'clock hour, even though we started late. I think it's a good point to wrap this up. And there's been a lot of comments and, and uh, questions that have come in through the chat that we haven't gotten to. And some of them are really good. Um, and I think we're going to try to get to them in, in future discussions. So I just wanted to go ahead and wrap up um wrap up the discussion and thank you both for joining us today for this kind of uh discussion webinar and thank everyone who participated and we will definitely um take your questions into consideration that we didn't get to did you did, did rich jim want to say anything closing i'll just say we're volunteer right now for round two whenever you're ready all right sounds yeah. good Thank you so much. Keep the, keep the dialogue open. Jim wants to follow up with just something he wants to read. Yeah, I'd just like to read something from uh, Code of Federal Regulations, Subpart M, 1926-502, Fall Protection Systems Criteria and Practices. Employers shall provide and install all fall protection system required by this subpart for an employee and shall comply with all other pertinent requirements of this subpart before that employee begins the work that necessitates the fall protection. So in other words, we don't think about it and start setting things up once we get on the job. It has to be done before the job. And we'll help. We can do it all. We can do it together. Everybody can help. That sounds great. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a Thank great everybody for being on today. All right. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.